Howdy folks and welcome back to World of Tanks with the Mighty Jengles and we have something relatively new for you today. This is Edvin E20 in the newish Italian Tier 8 heavy tank, the Progetto 54. I believe it's probably fair to say that opinions are mixed where this tank is concerned. It's not that the Progetto 54 is a bad tank, it's just that there isn't really anything that it does particularly well. In most respects, it's distinctly average. On the bright side, that of course means that there's nothing specifically bad about it either. But even where it's good, it comes with certain qualifiers. The mobility, for example. It has a fairly good top speed of 45 kilometers per hour. Remember, this is a heavy tank. It's actually faster than the British Centurion medium tanks. But the traverse speed is terrible, and with the stock engine, it's painfully slow. Now, that speed, of course, does come at a cost. The armour is not great. With the exception of the upgraded turret, which from the front at least is pretty good, but the hull is generally quite bad all round. Although the upper glacis at the front is very nicely sloped and is 100mm thick, but that's really only going to be a benefit to you when you're top tier in a tier 8 battle like this. Where the gun is concerned, it's another case of bad news, good news. Let's go over that in slightly more detail as Edwin moves to take up a blocking position here on the southern flank of the map. For a start, as you can see, 9 degrees of gun depression in combination with that, for tier 8 at least, tough turret front, is a useful combination. It's a combination that does allow him to make best use of this gun's one outstanding feature. The fact that, like the Italian medium tanks, it's an auto-reloader. This means that it has very good burst damage for a heavy tank. Even though the individual shells don't do a huge amount of damage, you can push out 960 average damage over the 7 seconds that it would take if you were to fire off all 3 shots as quickly as possible. That's the good news. The bad news is that, even taking this into account, this tank has atrociously bad damage per minute. It's even worse than the Tiger II, by a fairly significant margin, and the Tiger II is not a tank that people talk about fondly when they're discussing tanks that are capable of pushing out monstrous amounts of sustained damage. And remember, this is a best case scenario if you have all three shots loaded, ready to go, and you pump them out as quickly as you can. You get a 960 damage burst, assuming they all hit and penetrate, which is by no means guaranteed, because the accuracy is okay, but not good. The aiming time is okay, but not good. And the penetration is, again, not even as good as the Tiger II with 220 millimeters using standard ammunition. Once you've expended all three of those shots, however, the already bad damage per minute becomes absolutely abysmal because it's an Italian auto reloader and the gun takes longer to load the more shots you've fired. Also, it does take as long as 7 seconds to fire off those 3 shots, during which time you're going to be exposed to return fire, which is where the relatively tough turret front and the 9 degrees of gun depression does come in handy and make that sort of thing viable, providing you can put this tank into a position to take advantage of it. Meanwhile, Edvin here, displaying remarkable powers of perception above and beyond the majority of the World of Tanks player base, actually looking at his mini-map in combination with the fact that the team are losing three tanks to six, and has realised that the northern flank is about to relocate him swiftly and safely to a position where he might actually be able to do something about that, has given him time to reload all three shots into this auto-reloader. There are still some friendly tanks up ahead, so the base isn't in immediate danger of falling, and he's probably also conscious of the fact that if he's abandoning the southern flank, it may crumble too in his absence, so he doesn't immediately rush up to the northeastern corner of the map and instead initially at least occupies a position where he can offer some fire support and turn around and head back the way he came if that should prove to be necessary. Up ahead there you can see the Italian tier 7 heavy tank, the Caro P88, digging in, attempting to repel the enemy IS-2 many 2s, as Edvin does what he can from this position, from this range, but with 0.38 accuracy, it's not great. It's not absolutely terrible, but it's not really good enough either. Nudges forward, takes a quick look to see if anybody's trying to sneak across the open ground at the middle, and maybe get another shot in on the IS-2 Mini 2s, but the Caro P-88 has managed to take him out himself. Unfortunately, while his friends were slow in arriving, 
they have arrived. And now that Edvin has expended all of the ammunition in the magazine, you can see just how atrociously bad the damage per minute is on this tank when that magazine is empty. Since there's nothing else for him to shoot at, and he does need to spend some time reloading anyway, and the Caro P-88 has died, and those two Super Hellcats are likely to be next, actually the closest Hellcat is in a position to fall back, but the one furthest away is pretty buggered, because he's got that one small rise in the ground to hide behind, and no real way of pulling back without getting shot up. Edvin just about to load the last shell into the clip, and not before time, because there is a TS-5 around the corner. And he has killed the Super Hellcat. One shot. Two shots. Pulls back before expending the third shot. He wants to at least have something approaching a decent reload. And if he was to fire off the third and final shot, his DPM, which is already perched precariously on the toilet seat, would tumble straight down into the bowl. He's got that second shot loaded. The third shot is almost there. And there's the TS-5. Aiming for the commander's hatch, because if he was to go any further forward and aim for the lower glacis, that would expose his fairly weak hull to return fire from the TS-5. Two shots out of three did it, TS-5 dead. Which is nice, because with the destruction of the TS-5, they're no longer outnumbered 8 to 3. Instead, they're only outnumbered 7 to 3. Edvin only has two surviving teammates. Challenger, who pulled back from the collapse of the southern flank down there, where only a few minutes ago Edwin was busy working a hold down position, and the Super Hellcat, who pulled back behind him. They've both occupied an extremely limited and extremely obvious for anybody attacking the base patch of real estate, the ridge overlooking the southern approach up there. Not that I'm being critical, they're on too many other places for them to realistically go, but there's not an awful lot of space up there for two tank destroyers to take advantage of. Edvin, being uncharacteristically optimistic for a World of Tanks player there in chat, telling them, come on, let's carry, wait for them to make a stupid push, hidden in the bushes as he is over here, and able to keep an eye on both the northern and southern approaches to the base. Something that, stuck as they are on the ridge up there, the two tank destroyers cannot do. Now, under the circumstances, stuck as they are in an extremely limited and obvious spot up there, it would be wise for the Challenger and the Super Hellcat to simply spot and let Edvin do the shooting. Not that they should both just sit there passively, but there is very, very limited concealment and hard cover for them to be able to pull back into after firing and giving their positions away. What would be useful was for them to not give their positions away when there are still enemy tanks able to shoot back at them that they can't one-shot kill and finish off after Edvin had softened them up. So the challenge is gone, didn't listen to Edvin's advice in chat to just peek out, and paid the price. Meanwhile, Edvin's careful positioning has allowed him to get the drop on an enemy Super Hellcat, attempting to sneak around from the rear. His first shot blows his tracks off, the Super Hellcat uses his repair kit, the second shot blows the tracks off again, and the third shot kills him. And because he pulled back before shooting, he didn't lose the camo bones from the bushes and was able to do so undetected. However, as he's urging the surviving Super Hellcat on the ridge to peek forward and spot those enemy tanks approaching from the south, he moves just a little too far forward out of cover and does manage to get himself spotted in return. The Super Hellcat, however, is able to knock out the SU-12244. And because he's no longer jostling for position with the Challenger, he's able to actually pull back into cover and escape immediate destruction. Meanwhile, Edvin has reloaded all three of his shots again. This, however, is still not the time to do anything hasty. He might have 960 burst damage available, but there's well over a thousand hit points of enemy tanks waiting in that narrow pass down to the south. He did get surprised by the Chinese T-34-2G fake tank, but he was able to take the shot on the turret. No damage was sustained, and because it only took him one shot to kill him, he was able to reload relatively quickly, maintain what damage per minute he had, and more importantly, still have that 960 burst damage ready to go. Pulls back quickly for a look through the bushes to make sure that there's nobody else trying to sneak up around behind them. And now it's time to do something about that 45 TP and the KV-3. Obviously, he wants to kill the 45 TP because he's on less than 200 health and would be a one-shot kill. Unfortunately, he runs into the KV-3 first and the KV-3 still has more health 
that it can handle in one go. Even more unfortunately, the Super Hellcat just couldn't keep his finger off the trigger, takes a big hit from the Scorpion G that just popped up in the middle of the map, and then gets finished off by the as yet undetected 45 TP. Which means that Edvin is now the last tank left alive on his team against four enemies. Bounces another shot off the turret, this time gold ammo from the KV-3. But it's the Scorpion G who definitely needs to die first. Now, if the KV-3, backed up by the 45 TP, was able to put his man pants on, there's a fairly good chance that the enemy team could have finished Edvin off here and now. But they don't. And that allows him to pull back and more importantly, reload. I'm not saying it would have been easy for the KB-3 and the 45 TP to kill him, but it would have been a damn sight easier than allowing him to disengage, fall back, check for the M4A1, we haven't seen him for a while, or at all, and reload his gun. Edwin would probably have had to kill the 45 TP first because he's on less than 200 health and a kill's a kill, it's one less gun shooting back at you, but that would have left him with only two shots with which to deal with the KV-3. When we last saw the KV-3, Edvin was going to need four shots to deal with him. But then he closes in, and, well, we can now see why the KV-3 was so reluctant to push Edvin's position. The Super Hellcat before he died did score a hit. The 45 TP has, for some bizarre reason, abandoned him to Edvin's tender mercies, which is a bit of a relief because it means he has exactly the number of shells that he needs to kill the KV-3. Of course, if that 45 TP is anywhere near, Edvin could be in a lot of trouble. So he immediately barrels down into the low ground to keep him nice and safe, hoping he doesn't run into any 45 TPs around the corner, and manages to get one shell reloaded. Starts working on the second one, still no sign of the 45 TP. Crests the ridge on the southern flank, has a quick peek, still no sign of the 45 TP, still no sign of the M4A1. Oh dear. Oh, what happened there? <laughs> oh, I wish we could have seen that. Oh well, never mind. Second shot reloaded. Working on the third shot. See how long this thing takes to reload once you've blown all of the shells. It is criminally slow. Right, two enemy tanks left. Edvin does still have all of his health. He's in a pretty good position, except there's less than three minutes of this battle remaining and we could actually end up with a draw here. The 45 TP could be anywhere. We know that he's on less than 200 health, so if Edvin can get the drop on him, he's dead. But he does have three kills, so we kind of have to assume that he's not a complete muppet, and you shouldn't expect to find him just derping around in the middle of open ground somewhere. The M4A1 Ravioli, on the other hand, well, it's not that he hasn't been spotted, it's just that he hasn't been spotted in about 10 minutes. So on the one hand, he could be absolutely anywhere. He's got a very nasty gun. And we have no idea how much health he has. On the other hand, the fact that he hasn't been spotted in 10 minutes probably indicates that he's AFK. The problem here, of course, is that an AFK tank can still spot you, and the 45 TP definitely is not AFK. The M4A1, however, definitely is. There he is in exactly the last position where he was spotted. The problem with AFK enemy tanks, however, is that all too often they can very suddenly become not AFK once somebody starts shooting at them. Edmund keeping them low ground in the gully, so even if the M4A1 is spotting them, hopefully the 45 TP won't be able to take advantage of it, and accelerating to ramming speed, so he doesn't have to use every single shot in his magazine, hopefully. Uh, well, yeah, it turns out he is, in order to deal with him. And suddenly the mystery of the magical, mythical, disappearing 45 TP has been resolved. And it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure out who. There's only one tank left on the enemy team, after all. Unfortunately for the enemy 45 TP, he's made a couple of pretty severe miscalculations. He started capping when there was a minute and 33 seconds of this game left, and it takes a minute and 40 seconds for a tank to successfully cap on its own. Also, he started capping when Edvin had just enough time to make it back and interrupt, and also just enough time to make it back and interrupt with all three shots reloaded. <laughs> and he only needs one. The 45 TP does try to make the most of the situation. He knows which way Edvin's going to have to come back to get him. 
but that doesn't mean he's able to do anything about it. A pretty impressive result for ending E20 in a pretty mediocre tank. Although it would have been even more impressive if he'd had the foresight to, uh, and I seem to be saying this a lot lately, form a battlefield platoon with the 4 kill Super Hellcat, because with 12 kills between them, that would also have been a crucial contribution to go along with the Ace Tanker, Radley Walters medal, high calibre and top gun. No matter which way you look at it though, that's an impressive result with nearly 7,500 damage done in a not terribly impressive tank, although it obviously helped that he was top tier. And it's probably slightly more impressive that the equally top tier Ferdinand at the bottom of the team list somehow managed to come away from this battle with exactly zero damage done. But I guess that just goes to prove that in World of Tanks absolutely anything is possible if you just try hard enough. Nevertheless, Edvin, well done on a superb result. I'd like to see you do that in this tank in a tier 10 battle. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't be holding my breath for the replay. Everyone else, I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.